You know, if you've been around a little while in South Africa, you will also remember that the scripture that so often has been used was Second Chronicles 7 verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, the Lord says, I will hear, I will forgive, and I will heal their land. And what I want to try to do is just again, like we sang about the goodness of the Lord, how ready the Lord is to respond whenever we humble ourselves, wherever we come to a place where we say, sorry, Lord. And uh, how, how ready the Lord is to, to hear <laughs> and to forgive and to heal us when we are finding us at a place that is not good. But you know, it's easy to say sorry. But you really have to be sorry. I was once standing in a queue in an airport with a trolley and you know those trolleys if if you move them and somebody hits you here behind it's really painful and so we were a long queue and we were moving along and the guy behind me hit me and I you know look at I'm oh, so sorry so sorry I said, okay, and I smiled to you, you know, everyone can make a mistake. But he was, you know, he was chatting and looking around. It wasn't long. He hit me another time. I'm so sorry. This time I didn't smile. It happened a third time. When he said, sorry, I said, I don't believe you. Uh, we really have, we really have to, to be sorry. Humility need to be in truth. And God knows our hearts. And uh, I was thinking about stories in the Old Testament. And we will, we'll come to the New Testament. How Jesus taught us about humility and humbling ourselves. But the first one is uh, when the people of Israel, you know, were coming from uh, Egypt. And Moses was up the mountain spending time with God. He spent 40 days, that is six weeks. And the people didn't know what happened to Moses. And they got impatient. And they, they didn't want to wait. Let's choose another leader. And then, you know, Aaron came by and I, I don't know what happened to Aaron, but Aaron was influenced by the people, you know. He later on explained to Moses that, you know, he told the people to bring their gold rings and stuff and put it into a fire and he liked to say a gold calf just jumped out of there. And I don't think it just happened like that. But it was, a, you know, a kind of a thing. We'll make a golden calf and we'll say he represents God kind of thing. Which was completely, so completely unacceptable. What such a sense of idolatry. And of course, God knew everything that was happening. And Moses came down. And it says, uh, it was the only time that all ten commandments was broken at once. Moses <laughs> threw down those uh, stone tablets because of his anger and because of his shock what happened. And God said to Moses, I'm not going with you anymore. These are a stiff-necked people. I may destroy them. But Moses was pleading. And Moses told the people, Exodus 32 and 33 and 34, take off all your jewelry and repent before the Lord. And Moses was pleading for the people. And, um, and Moses said, Lord, I, I don't know what to do. You promised to be with me. You said you know me by name and I have found favor with you. But I, know, I don't know what to do. I don't know who's going with us. And the Lord responded, Moses, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses was so delighted. He said, Lord, if your presence doesn't go with us, what makes us different from all the other uh, people on the face of the earth? God's presence. And um, 
Okay, I've already said about Second Chronicles. But the next one, and this is an extreme one, we find at 1 Kings chapter 21, it's about Asaph. Now it says in 1 Kings 21 that Asaph was the most wicked and terrible king that ever lived. And God sent Elijah basically to pronounce God's judgment against him and was going to tell him what was going to happen to him and his uh, descendants and it was just terrible. And then when, when uh, Elijah left, it says Asaph humbled himself with fasting and putting on sackcloth and went around meekly. And the Lord stopped Elijah as he was sort of leaving. He said, Elijah, did you see? Asaph has humbled himself. And because he has humbled himself, the judgment that I pronounce will not happen in his days, but in the days of his son. Isn't that amazing? The most wicked king who ever lived humbled himself and God responds. And I think that extreme example just proves the fact that, that God wants us to humble ourselves. God wants us to repent. God wants us not to die, but to live. Then we get to David. David was such a good man, a man after God's own heart, but he was just a man. And he find himself at the wrong place at the wrong time where kings went out to war. And we know the story of Bathsheba and how he committed adultery, but not only adultery, how he basically organized that the husband of Bathsheba was killed in the war. So he was a murderer and an adulterer. And you know, Andre talk about the heart. His heart was so hard, he just went on until God used the prophet to speak to him, to tell him a story about a rich man and a poor man and how the, the rich man grabbed the one little lamb of the poor man and slaughtered that for his guest. And David was angry and said, such a man must surely die. And Nathan said, you are the man. And he realized that was true. And he repented ever so deeply. Psalm 51 was where he pleaded with God. God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Wash me, cleanse me. But then the thing that, that so touched me, where he realized God doesn't want sin offerings and guilt offerings. That's not what God requires. What God wants is a broken heart, the sacrifice of a broken heart and a contrite spirit is this whole thing of humility, true humiliation before the Lord. And David knew God well enough to know that God will never reject our sacrifice of humility and saying sorry to the Lord. In the New Testament, <clears throat> The thing that just touched me so much about the Lord Jesus, John 3, we all know verse 16, or I hope we do. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. But verse 17 says, God did not send His Son to condemn the world, but to save the world. So whoever believes, he saved. Whoever is not, not believed will be condemned. God did not send His Son to condemn. Jesus did not come to condemn. Amen? <laughs> you know, the Satan so often accuses us and condemns us. God wants to save us. Jesus did not come to condemn. I'm sure we all know John 8, the story of the adulterous woman that was brought by the Pharisees and other people to Jesus said, this woman was caught in the act of adultery and in the law it is written that such a person must be stoned. So it's just Jesus was just bending down and writing with his hand in the sand. And you know, and finally he just said, the one without sin can throw the first stone. One by one they started to leave until no one was left. Jesus looked up, looked at the woman, 
and said, Did no one condemn you? No, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. This is the heart of the Lord Jesus. Jesus invites us in Matthew 28, not Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. All who are weary and tired, come to me and I will give you rest. Come and learn from me because I am meek and humble. Put my yoke upon you and it will be light and it will be easy. Maybe if I say who of us feel weary and tired, that a number of us will, will say, I'm there, I'm weary, I'm tired. Let's hear the invitation of the Lord to come and find rest with Him, but also to learn from Him. And what is the thing that He wants to teach us? He said, learn from me because I am meek and I am humble. And brothers and sisters, most of the pain that we suffer in life comes from our own pride. Somebody said something about me. <clears throat> it was so painful, you know. How could he do that? And it was, you know, well, if I'm truly humble, well, <laughs> I'm a sinner, I'm a fellow sinner, I'm saved by God's grace. But I also know that I'm a son of God. And, uh, you know, I don't want to be a hypocrite. You know, it was a few years ago that somebody criticized us severely. And my wife and I, <laughs> we suffered pain. It took us a while to realize it was our own pride. It wasn't necessary to be so upset. Come and learn from me because I am meek and I am humble. You know, the most terrible thing that can happen in our lives is to fall into pride. That is the most terrible thing that can happen to you and me. Praise the Lord. God is helping us. <laughs> he sent Paul a thorn in the flesh to help him not to be proud because the moment we are proud the bible says god resists the proud but gives grace to the humble god turns his back upon us when we are proud but he will always give us grace the moment we humbled ourselves and then we have all the scriptures if you humble yourself god will exalt you if you exalt yourself god will have to humble you you know, and it works like a law of nature. That's how it is. So I'm sorry, Mr. Putin. You will not get away with this at the end. You may feel so, so big and so strong and think you can do everything you want. God is there. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled by the Lord. But then, who, he who humbles himself will be exalted. Last scripture. In Revelation 3, we have, you know, from chapter 2, we have the letters to the seven churches. And one of the letters was to the church of Laodicea. Do you know what was their problem? Lukewarmness. The Lord said, I would rather have you warm or cold, but not lukewarm. Because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. And he said, that's a bit of soft translation. The real thing is he will vomit us out of his mouth. And he said, you say, you know, I have everything and I lack nothing and I'm, you know, I'm okay. The Lord says, and you don't even know, you are blind. You are naked. You are wretched. And you are poor. Come and buy from me. So in this context, you get to verse 19 that says of chapter 3, those ones that God loves, He rebukes. And then that beautiful verse, 
that says, I stand at the door and knock. The Lord says, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever opens the door and come in, I will have fellowship with him. I will dine with him. And that's the invitation of the Lord. And you know, thinking about in that context where the way people were doing was so unacceptable to the Lord, and, and God just responded by saying, I love you. <laughs> and I'm standing at your door and I'm knocking. Just open the door for me. And of course, it will take humility to open the door and to invite the Lord to come in. And I want us today, you know, our hearts are really with the people of Ukraine and Russia all the people involved in the war but we will begin with ourselves in a sense by just seeing seeing God who says I don't want I'm not here to condemn I did not send my son to condemn uh, I rebuke you because I love you but I stand at the door and I knock if you are weary and tired, accept my invitation. Come to me. I will minister to you. So why don't we just bow our heads and uh, let the Lord minister to us. Let's see the Lord Jesus in His beauty, in His love, and His readiness to meet us where we are at.